I want to I want to start with encouragement because when you have a have a heavy heavier type message, weightier message, you want to go back in time and see God's faithfulness. God has always spoken about events that are happening on the horizon. If you go into the scriptures, Jesus, when Jesus was about to be crucified, and they had rejected him, the city of Jerusalem. And he said, do not weep for me. Weep, weep for your children. And so what he did is in a very indirect way, he said, what's not going to happen in your lifetime is going to happen in your children's lifetime. And he was speaking of a very specific event. Now, with his, so he said that in general to the crowd, but to his disciples, he spoke a prophetic word with instruction. And he said, they're, they're admiring the temple. It's beautiful. They're admiring the temple. And they marvel at the temple with Jesus. Jesus, you know, he, he sometimes can undercut the party. He came in and he said, I tell you the truth, not one stone is going to be left on this. And you can go to Jerusalem today and you can see the pile of stones off that part that is called the Temple Mount. It's basically a platform, kind of like the guys built back here. They tossed all the stones, the Romans tossed all those stones off of that. But he also said this, and they said, well, what will be the sign? So it opened up kind of an end times discussion with the disciples, and they said, well, what's going to be the sign of your coming? And so he talks about the distant future, and he talks about the near future. He talks about and the, the, the judgment that was going to come within 40 years to Jerusalem, which was actually a, a, a turning point event that separated the new church, the sect that followed Jesus Christ, that was considered still considered Judaism at the time, and it diverged into the Christian church, and the Jews went this way, and the Christian church went this way. And Jesus had warned them, and he said, there's going to come a division, and he said, you're going to be abandoned to your unbelief for quite a while. <laughs> And I'm going to go, and I'm going to, I'm going to bless other peoples who will receive. What was intended for you, I'm going to give to others. And then he said this. He said, when you see armies surrounding Jerusalem, he said, get out of this city. And so the Christian church. When they saw the Roman army, and if you look at the history of it, the Roman army surrounded Jerusalem. And it was one of those things where human nature, you're hoping, okay, things have been good, so maybe it's not going to happen. Maybe it's just a bluff. Maybe the Romans aren't going to come and sack Jerusalem. And so what happened was the Romans came and they threatened. Now what we've learned in our clinic We've had some de-escalation lessons. Is when someone threatens, pay attention to the threat. <clears throat> because we're having more and more unruly patients. Mm. When someone threatens, believe them when they first say it to you. So Jesus said, when you see Jerusalem surrounded, get out. So you have to look at the history. Josephus has it, and, the, and there's others. But basically, the Romans came, and they threatened, and then they kind of pulled back a little bit, and everybody's like, Phew. when the Romans pulled back, the Christians said, this is our time to get out. Hmm. And they got out of the city. And they dispersed. Because they knew that the prophetic time had, had come to fullness. Jesus had spoken about it. And it actually led to a rift with the Jews saying, in our time of trouble, you abandoned us. Hmm. And now that's long history past, but basically that began a divergence 
And then what happened is those concentrated group of Christians spread. Many of them spread all over the Roman Empire and began to be missionaries. So God took a very dark event and he turned it into something great for those who listened. And for those who didn't listen and didn't discern the times, it was bad indeed. Another example is Rome. So Rome was Christianized, at least superficially, but it had become corrupt. And so Augustine, who lived in North Africa, he writes about it in a book called The City of God. And he writes The City of God based upon the destruction of the burning of Rome, the sacking of Rome by barbarians. Now those barbarians were a lot of our ancestors. <laughs> Germans and French people, <clears throat> north, people from the north. They were idol worshippers, the pagans. And they came and they sacked Rome and diminished what had been a, a grand kingdom. And in that process, Christians got spread in the north. Europe, and started a process of Christianization there. Missional. God would show up. There were signs, wonders, miracles, often. Oftentimes God would show up and signs, wonders, and miracles, and there'd be a new church. Churches, they'd get, they'd get persecuted, and they'd run all over the place. Hmm. This is what trouble can do if you're in step with the Lord. So we should not be afraid of times of trouble, but we should also be discerning of those times. Because God wants us to be in the know. He doesn't want us to be ignorant. It says in the Bible, don't be ignorant of the times and seasons. I'll give you one more example. When I did the DNA test, I have a segment of DNA from Switzerland. And that segment of DNA comes from my mom's side of the family. It comes from her mother. They were Protestants who fled Europe. So they, they had been in the area of Switzerland and then, you know, there, during the Reformation, there were areas of refuge for Protestants. Those who had uh, rebelled from the Catholic Church and, and sought a more vibrant faith and so they moved all over Europe. They started generally in the area of Germany, Switzerland, Geneva. And then what happened is, eventually, within a few years, a state church got established. And the state church of Germany, or wherever, didn't like those more radical Christians, so they, they moved them away, moved them west. And most of them, some of them then ended up in France, and then they weren't welcome there. So then they ended up in England. Eventually they weren't welcome there. And so the king of England said, tell you what, there's all these new colonies. You want to have freedom of worship? Go across the ocean. But when you prosper there, send it back to me. Mm. And that's how the majority of vibrant Christians from the 1600s ended up in the United States. It was constant. God arranged that pressure. Moravians, Mennonites, Baptists and Anabaptists, Lutherans, or all the different groups of people. God created a, a wild wilderness that had its own challenges that would keep people coming back to him for a while. And it formed the substance of the great nation that we live in today. It came through trouble. It came through pressure. Sometimes greatness only emerges under pressure. The pearl. It takes the irritation. Uh, 
of the oyster, where sand and whatever other kind of stuff is can then turn into a pearl. The diamond, anthracite, and coal has to be put under pressure for a diamond to form. Only God knows that combination of how that happens. So I want to talk for a moment about the time of trouble. And this could be a bigger time of trouble, or it could be a smaller time of trouble. I'm not sure. But if there's ever been a prophetic word about a moment by people who are prophetic from years ago, and when major events happen, I typically don't listen to people who just start saying prophetic stuff in that moment. I like to go backwards. So I'm going to read you a word from July 29th, 1996. By a guy named David Wilkerson. And it's a very small passage. You can bring up, uh, it's the, uh, it's one of those two. Is it this one? Uh, that one is, uh, that one's the second. We'll do that in a second. That one's from 1975. You can make that a little bit bigger. This is a message from David Wilkerson from 1996. Now, I want you to think of our headlines today. Isaiah wept so hard because a false security had gripped the people, and God was no longer even in their thoughts. Instead, everyone clung to a brazen self-confidence and said, we'll go it alone. America today is caught in the deception of a similar false security. The Russian Empire has fallen. Iraq has been defeated. And now we think, who's strong enough to challenge our mighty army? There's no one left to bomb us. No longer a hydrogen scare. We trust it in our armor. But you got to understand, 1996 was a good year. Uh, uh, Economy's booming. <coughs> World, for the most part, is at peace. America's won. Not a lot of terrorism. There's a little bit of stuff. But everything's doing really well. China's just starting to make our goods, making them cheap. <laughs> this Clinton years were actually really good years. Prosperity wise for our nation. And in the middle of this, this guy has this prophetic word to spoil the party. Just like Jesus did 40 years before the fall of Jerusalem. Mm. But beware, Russia's not dead. The bear that the Bible said would be wounded will come back alive. I don't know where that is in the Bible, but it must be something. And that Russian bear is stirring right now. I don't know whether it will be happened by coup or by election, but the two or three men, one was Vladimir Putin, who are in line for leadership in Russia, are all anti-Christian, ultimately anti-Semitic, but he's used Israel for his own purposes, and anti-American. Communism is still very much alive. These men who will come to power shortly will not be afraid to threaten America or the world. They will not take their finger off the hydrogen button, nuclear. Right now, the Russian army is looking at its wounds, itching to remove its shame from the world. Once it will is finally released, it will conquer its former states and then threaten Europe with a hydrogen holocaust. That is happening today. Today. That's the headlines this morning. I'm sure, I, I, when I read this, I was like, a dictator is going to rise overnight, a man who threatens the whole world. Hitler rose up out of chaos, and so will a new belligerent Russia. Just watch as emissaries from all over the world start flocking to Moscow. Don't be deceived, which has happened. You know, all this diplomacy and shutting. Don't be deceived by the relative peace our nation now enjoys. It is merely the calm before the storm. That's written by a man who's going to be with the Lord in 1996. He was excoriated for this word. 
How could you say, in the midst of our prosperity, when Russia's on the decline, that something like this is going to happen? And here we are in 26 years later. That word is a headline. This tells me, be careful. Because God it had enough of an impact to where it was on the prophetic radar years ago. And it doesn't say what's going to happen. What it says is, this is the scenario. To give you an idea of how unlikely this was, in 2012, the presidential candidates, Barack Obama and Mitt Romney, had a debate. They said, who's the greatest threat in the United States? And I don't know what Barack Obama said. But Mitt Romney said Russia, Al Qaeda, and ISIS. Right? Yeah, Al Qaeda, and ISIS, and, and Mitt Romney said Russia. Climate change and, uh, and something like that. And Mitt, and so then Barack Obama had a one-liner. He said, "Mitt, I hate to tell you, but the 1980s have called and we want the foreign policy back." <laughs> yeah, that's a fire pit. Two years later, Russia. Annexed Crimea, <clears throat> and we didn't take it seriously. And then years have gone by. I talked to a friend of mine on Friday night whose father was from Russia and mother was from Ukraine. I said, What's your take on this? She said, My mom said, This is what Russia and Ukraine have been living in the shadow now for eight years. It's not like it came from nowhere. Mm. This is a prophetic word. Here's another prophetic word from 1975 from a prophetic guy named <laughs> Bob Jones. Bob Jones, who was, had gone on to be with the Lord. Both of these men have gone on to be with the Lord. Bob Jones, not the guy from here, not the university guy. It's the guy from Arkansas. He's the guy who spoke to Mike Bickle about IHOP, about the little... Asian, Asian people will have little TVs in their hand and they'll be watching the prayer room in Kansas City. I told him that in the early 80s. He said, they'll be out in Asia. He way. said, you're going to have a ministry that's going to have a lot of Asians. It's going to be prayer and worship because God's going to establish places of refuge. He said, in the future, he said, grain from Kansas City in a 500 mile radius is going to be like gold. He said, it's going to be like Joseph's storehouse. And he said, God's going to manifest his glory in Kansas City, but he's going to raise up an area of refuge through prayer. This week, with the blockade of Ukraine, which is a major grain area, grain prices are already up 15%. And that's under the assumption, now this isn't even grain season. That's just under the assumption that potentially they're not going to have a crop. That's the beginning. So Bob Jones, in this, he had this encounter with the war back in 1975. And Bob is having this encounter with the war. These, it's an interesting thing. These people are in line and some are going to heaven and some are going to hell. Depending on what they serve. Depending on who they chose. And it's a sad thing where this line goes all the way and some people are going away from the Lord and some people are coming and this, he tells a story about this, this black woman who comes up joyous to Jesus, gives like a, like a hug. And so Jesus knew this woman and said, you learned to love. Did you learn to love? You made it. But then, Bob saw these other people that were being lost. And he said, no, Bob, you can come into the, you can come be with me now. But he says, if I'll send you back, I'll, I'll send you back and save some. And so, this is where he says, so Bob agreed, he said, if I can go back and help save one more person, it would be worth it. 
then he had this vision. He said he was sent back with two angels who were taking him back to his, I guess, his body or the earth. And on their way back, the angels showed Bob a vision. He saw the United States, and there was a brilliant nuclear-like explosion filled with dazzling crystal light in the heart of the country. 1975, he told Bob that God had chosen Kansas City in the Midwest. The explosion symbolized the Holy Spirit power, power birth from a movement of prophetic intercession that would come out of that area and touch the whole earth. Be a movement of young people. And they would fill stadium. They'd fill the Arrowhead Stadium. And there'd be an open heaven in that area. This is 1975. Mike Bickle was not even in Kansas City. There's no IHOP. There's none of that. Then he said this. He saw that Kansas City would become a city of refuge. And that there were several others that would be set up. Greenville, South Carolina. How do we know that? <laughs> the angels told Bob that there would be another world war, like World War III, and that these cities of refuge are going to be needed. That there's coming a great famine in all the earth. And he's going to raise up Kansas City as a physical and spiritual breadbasket. And on the East Coast, there will be a limited nuclear exchange during this war. Kind of a footnote at the end. Wow. Are we in that time? Are we? Or close? Or do we get another reprieve? I don't know. What I do know is the prophetic setup is there for times to change. Now, I have great confidence that we're right where God's called us to be. I came to Greenville not wanting to come to Greenville. I didn't want to come. I wanted to stay in Charleston. I came to Traveler's Rest with some of these men because that's what the Lord set before us. And then when we came, the sign was out there. And it's been hard in many ways. It's been worth it. It's been hard. But the Lord told me that this would be an area of refuge. That he'd develop a community. He'd develop a community on the north side of Paris Mountain. Like spirit-filled Mennonites. And that it would be for such a time as this. Because of the trouble that's coming. Now, the interesting thing about that newsletter from David Wilkerson is he spoke just before he spoke about Russia... He spoke about a pandemic. And he said, even if a pandemic came and disrupted the whole world, that will not be enough to shift the hearts of people back towards the world. Huh. That's what he said. You can read it. 1996. His newsletter from July 20 something, 1996. So, having talked about the prophetic word there, I want to look for a moment. Now, I want to jump to the individual. And then we'll jump back into what's happening for a moment. The Bible tells us four ways to be prepared for these times. Okay. So I want us to look, go down to the bottom of the list. How to respond in times like 227-22. We're going to look at a few verses here. Now, let me go ahead. If you, want to, if you have a pen, I want you to write down, because we may not get to all of these, but I want to give you some passages of Scripture that need to be the central part of your prayer and study right now. Zechariah chapter 12. Which chapter? Zechariah chapter 12. Second Peter 3. First.
1 Thessalonians 5. Matthew 24. And Luke 21, particularly the part where he talks about the end times. Because there's, there's a lot in that chapter. Luke 21. Luke 21. Those five chapters will help us. They will help us to begin to put some puzzle pieces together. And help to discern the times. How can we respond personally? I want to make sure that we cover this, and then whatever time we have left, we'll look at a couple of other things. Number one, watch and discern unfolding events. Now, there's two parts to this. Watch the unfolding events out there, but watch your response in heart and spirit for what's happening. What I would say is this. Here's your first response. Fear. Or disconnect. I, there's someone that I know who was talking about the situation last week at my work in my work area. And he said, it doesn't matter what they do over there. It's never going to affect us here. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Never. Fear. These are negative things. Disconnect. Coldness. Indifference. Oh well. Okay, sera sera. What will be will be. It is what it is. That saying that everyone loves in our culture, which is not full of faith. <laughs> it is what it is. It's not a faithful statement. So be careful when you say that. Watch and discern what's happening out there, but be especially careful because you can't really change other than prayer out there. But I can tell you this, if we are not in alignment with the Lord, with expectancy, with joy, with saying, Lord, use this to sharpen me in this time, then we won't be affected. And if we're not effective in prayer, we're not really, we're going to be bystanders. I tell you the truth, this prayer room can have the control and command center to move nations. Do I think it's time for the world to unravel? I don't. Could the world unravel right now? Could. Take very little. But it also would take very little for the Lord to shift it another way. Yeah. He did it. He did it for um, Hezekiah, surrounded in Jerusalem. Waters had come up to his head, had been prophesied about. He cried out to the Lord and had a prophet there. And the Lord said, because you cried out to me and because this guy from Assyria has insulted me, I'm going to send him back. Forget the guy's name, the Assyrian king. God sends a plague, lets a plague come. The army was playing with the devil, so the Lord let the devil play with them. That's what happened in that time. And so then the king, uh, whatever his name was, from Assyria, they ended up having a plague. They went back home, and then he, his own family, one of his own family members assassinated him. That's sometimes how world events can happen. God is very powerful. And in the end, it's God's devil. In other words, the devil's will and desire is not preeminent. Watch and discern unfolding events. Let's look at Luke 12, 56. As a matter of fact, let's do this. Somebody who wants to grab Luke 12, 56. Who wants to grab Matthew 26, 41? A little Bible drill here. Luke 21. That's right, you need that Bible. <laughs> Luke 12, 56. 
two together. Matthew 26, uh, 41. Okay, and then Luke 21, 29, 34. Christian's got it right here. Okay, go ahead, read it out. Read it from your Bible, read it from Luke 12, 56. Somebody read it. Who, who has it? I'll read it. Okay. <laughs> Make it big. Let's see. Hypocrites, you can discern the face of the sky and of the earth, but how is it that you do not discern this time? This is Jesus speaking. Jesus says, discern the time. Matthew 26, 41. Watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Watch and pray. Now, when the Bible talks about watching, what does it mean? Be alert. Be engaged. That's a way that we watch sometimes. You ever been in QT and be watching? <laughs> you, yeah, you're being your observant. You, anybody ever gone to QT downtown and you're kind of looking? See? You're finding your pathway out without Isn't getting that handled. Isn't let me tell you a quick story about this. So I had a patient who was special ops in Iraq, and then he was with the State Department. He wouldn't mess with this guy. We moved down to Greenville, and so we're sitting in a room with a, with a window. He's looking straight ahead, and he all of a sudden he says, did you see that bird that just got injured over there? And sure enough, this car hit, and the guys, he's looking out of the periphery of his vision. He discerns that this bird had gotten just barely scraped by this car. And he said, I wonder if that bird's okay. It's like, what bird? He's like, it's over there. It's like, you're not even looking there. He says, I've learned to look all around. Hmm. He said, how remember, I was in Iraq. He said, and I've had to do security for State Department officials all over the world. And so uh, Brazil, he's actually in Brazil, he spoke Portuguese. Well, and he said, I've learned to watch. And he told me some of the things he does to watch. And what He said, well, you can do this to be aware of your surroundings. He says, never sit in the middle of a restaurant. Always be in a place where you can have this view, not your... So he, he has, there's strategy involved with watching. Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation, for the flesh indeed is willing, but the, the, the flesh is, the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Asking God to, Lord, lead me into wisdom, lead me not into temptation. It comes in the Lord's Prayer, be in vigilant prayer. If prayer is a lower priority, we are much more likely to make mistakes in the basic things of life. And our priorities are very much likely to be off. But if prayer is sharp, we're touching the Lord, we're here for them. We're going to make better decisions. We're going to have more resources. We're going to have more time. And we're not going to waste our life trying to fill in the hole, digging a hole of bad decisions, and then trying to, to fill it. Watch and pray. Ask the Lord for help. Be active. See, I was unaware about watching in the sense of my patient, but he helped me to see something I wasn't seeing. The bird, by the way, ended up living. <laughs> Got done. Luke 21, 29 to 34. Then he spoke to them a parable. Look at the fig tree and all the trees. When they are already budding, you see and know for yourselves that summer is now near. So you also, when you see these things happening, know that the kingdom of God is near. Assuredly, I say to you... Oh, wait, wait, 31? 34. 34, okay, okay. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. But take heed to yourselves... Lest your hearts be weighed down with carousing, drunkenness, the cares of this life, and that day come on you unexpectedly. 
because it's going to come as a snare to Holter. How do we know spring's coming? What have we seen this week? The, is it the lilies or daffodils, daffodils, daffodils sprouting up? More daffodils. Buds on trees. Red buds on trees. Does that mean fall's Jeez. coming? Winter? Spring. 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 I think it's. Clouds so, max. Here's what Jesus said. Jesus said. Go up just a little bit there. Look at the fig tree. Look at all the trees. When they're budding, you know for yourself that summer, I guess they didn't really have a word for spring, but maybe, that time is coming. Okay. That's in Luke 21. Now, what is that time? I'll read this. This is on the handout. Now, when I talk about there's twin crises on the earth, where we've just come through a pandemic, two years, I mean, we're on the downside, I believe, with that. Um, and now this geopolitical, potentially major, major shift in the world is here. But Jesus talked about this. And he said it in context. And here's what he said in Luke 21. Now this is, he said here, look up when these things are happening, all in a cluster, know that this is the time you're living in. He said to them, nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. Is that happening mm -hmm. right now in a major way? Mm -hmm. There will be great earthquakes in various places. Mm -hmm. I mean, those things happen, I, I don't know, we'll see. Famines and pestilences. <laughs> you know what a pestilence is? Disease, Disease and, and uh, worldwide uh, pandemic. Plague. The dust thing? Yeah. There will be fearful sights and great signs from the heavens. Now, remember, Jesus lived in a time when there wasn't missiles raining down on cities. Mm -hmm. That's a pretty fearful sight. Yeah. That's coming from the heavens. So don't think it's UFOs coming across the sky. And it's, <laughs> although we have a lot more of that because we have a lot of satellites, a lot of strange stuff like that. Drones. So, and it's a pretty fearful sight if you've got an armed drone headed to it. Mm. That's a, but then there will be great signs in the heavens. So I think that those things are still ahead too. But before all these things, okay, before all these things, now Jesus, you got to understand Luke 21, he's jumping to the end of time and he's jumping back to what's going to happen in Jerusalem in those 40 years. Because it's, it's called an echo fulfillment. Mm -hmm. And it's throughout the whole scripture. It's very beautiful how those things happen. Like, kind, lesser quality. Now you got to understand this invasion. Because the Bible says in Ezekiel 38, 39, it's a whole other verse, is that the region of Russia, Gog and Magog, that is going to have a coalition of nations in the future, and it's going to come down on Israel like it's doing in the Ukraine right now. That's what it says in Ezekiel 38, 39. And that's at the very end. Some people think that's Armageddon. Some people think it's a, another battle. I'm not really sure. But it's a lot of nations are aligned against little Israel. And God says he releases judgment on those nations and destroys them. For how they've treated the church and the Jewish people over the millennia. Their persecutions come back to haunt them. It says, before all these things happen, they will lay hands on you and persecute you. Now, this happened in the initial persecution of the church. Delivering you up to the synagogues and prisons. Now, this is repeated throughout history and probably will repeat again. You will be brought before kings and rulers for my sake, but it will turn out for you as an occasion for testimony. Therefore, settle it in your heart not to meditate beforehand on what you will answer. In other words, the Lord says, I don't need you to figure it out. I got it figured out. Just stick with me. <laughs> for I will give you a mouth and wisdom which all your adversaries will not be able to contradict or resist. 
You will be betrayed even by parents and brothers, relatives and friends, and they will put some of you to death. Well, that's happened. That's a direct prophetic fulfillment. This happened over the generations to the church. And, and to a lesser extent, to Jewish people. They've been particularly persecuted. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake, but not a hair of your head shall be lost. By your patience, possess your soul. Now that gives us a clue there. First of all, be confident that when you walk close with the Lord, and when you're in communion with Him, not one part of what's going to last eternally is going to be hurt. Jesus said, fear not those who will kill the body, and then can't do anything else. But be in reverence of the one who, if the body's killed, has the ability to send to hell or go to heaven. Jesus says here, Not a head of your hair will be lost. You know, in this life, sometimes you lose your hair. <laughs> but in eternity, not one hair is lost. Not one. Another way he says it is he says, not one true grain is lost. He says, not one sparrow falls that he doesn't know about. Not one grain of kernel is lost. What? Well, not one person who. It's not like Jesus says, okay, let's get 98%. If I can get 98% of the people there saved in eternity, I mean, a 2% loss isn't that bad. He says, not one. He says, I have the ability to save to the uttermost. Everyone who comes to me will be saved. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's that simple in this time. The pressure of the times helps to make the choice clear. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. He is not going to lose one. Now he says, you may have trouble. You may lose your life. There may be a nuclear thing. There may not be. But you don't have to live in fear. But I want you to be aware of the times. I want you to be aware of the seasons. But he says, I have it under control. By patience, get to know the Holy Spirit and let the fruit of the Spirit come and reign in your life, in your hearts. Move away from the wishy-washy James reality of the double-minded man or woman. God's with me. Oh, is God with me? Oh, God's with me. God, is God with me? That will wear you out. We all can live that way when we trust in ourselves. But when we trust in Him, He'll make us like Mount Zion. He'll make us stable. So that we will be strong and those who know their God will do great exploits. I tell you, if a Jewish man in Ukraine who doesn't even know Jesus Christ as Savior can stand up like David and change the world. There was an article today that said Zelensky's video to whatever the European Council. It said, this video came in where he said, I'm going to die in my country if I have to. And then that's what he said. I don't need a ride. I need, I need ammunition, not a ride. There's something about that bravery. It said the European Council, all these stately European leaders, they said they were in shock and silence because they live streamed him in. And these pacifist European leaders said, whatever he needs, give it to him. They said that was the, that was that's when. Germany said, we'll send them weapons. You know how hard it is to get Germany to send you weapons? <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a lot. This is why I really pray God will bring this thing down, give us a reprieve, and teach this guy a lesson. Hmm. There is a day when tyrants and these types of rulers come to an end. How long, O oh God, will these tyrants rule the earth? How long? The Lord knows. Watch, discern the unfolding myths. Let's go, we'll go a little bit faster through these. Have confidence in the Lord, and if you have confidence in Him, you'll project confidence. Are we afraid of these times? No! We've aligned our time, our whole lives for these types of times. 
I wouldn't be living here. We wouldn't be building stuff. We wouldn't be trying to have a vision, Cassie, for community when people betray you. All around us has been over the years. It's been hard. Bill and Gina have been the most faithful over the years. Steady, quiet. And, uh, but I tell you the truth, it doesn't <laughs> help to betray. Because we've seen, just, let's stay with the Lord. There's a positive message there. The scripture says we're not those who draw back and are destroyed. But we're those who press forward in faith and receive what God has promised. We're going to receive it one way or the other. We're going to receive it whether we go to be with the Lord in the rapture or whatever. Or whether we, by natural death, we, we go. It's, it's going to be one way or the other. But there's something about a man or woman who's not afraid to die for what they believe in. Number two, stay sober and alert in the spirit of prayer from the inside out. Here's what I would say about that. A vibrant prayer life. God is much more concerned about you being in touch with Him, hearing from Him, praying, than just praying about world events. What does it matter to pray for world events if our hearts are distant from the Lord? You know what I mean? And, and it's not even fun to pray for world events if your heart's <laughs> here, there, and yonder. The best intercession you can make for the nations is to be in a good place for the Lord. When you're in His counsel, you're listening to Him. You're hearing from Him. I mean, He may say, I love the church in Russia. Don't hate the church in Russia. Because there's a church in Russia. They have a bad leader. And they have spiritual strongholds over their country. You can look at the... I was reading some of the spiritual history of, of the Slavic people. They have been hard. They, are, they were known to the bishops and the, the, the vibrant Orthodox priests back in the Middle Ages as the people who always backslide. That's what the Slavs were known as. People who were stubborn and always backslide. And were always having to go back to try to bring them back. At least they had vibrant shepherds. And they brought grief. That's some of the stronghold of that area. But the Lord may whisper to your heart and say, I love the church in Russia. Pray for them. I love the church in Ukraine. Pray for them. Pray for the offense that's going on between those two. Pray for the churches here in Greenville that have Ukrainians and Russians in them. Because Satan likes to slither in and create division between those two groups of people. There are vibrant Ukrainian-Russian churches right in this area. When we did outreach downtown, we were always meeting these people. So we met Nadia. So Dave Cadell goes to one of those churches right there. And they're full of Ukrainians and Russians. And they will tell you that Ukrainians aren't Russians and Russians aren't Ukrainians. They'll be the first to tell you that. We're not the same people. We have a different language. We're similar. We're both Slavs, but we're not the same. It's like saying we're British. We're not British. We speak English. Yeah. We're not, <laughs> yeah, we have a similar lineage for most people, for European, most of us. But it doesn't mean we're the same people. We're only the same people with the church. Stay sober and alert with prayer from inside out. 1 Thessalonians 5, 17 to 19. There's that Matthew 26, 41. Again, we won't read that one again. And then Luke 21, 36. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Do not put out the Spirit's fire. Do not treat prophecies with contempt. How far do you go? Uh, you can go to 22. That's a, the emphasis of the 19, but it's all good. Test everything. Hold on to the good. Avoid every kind of evil. Notice it says, do not despise prophecy. Um, stay sober and alert. 
when Spain says, pray without ceasing. Always be, doesn't mean you're always having to say stuff. I mean, if you ever met the, like, super religious person, they want you to think they're praying all the time. Nobody prays all the time. And huh? that, that, that just, that doesn't happen. But you can get into a situation where everything you see around you can be touched in prayer. I liken it to a clean house. If you walk in a house and you see where someone's dusted and they've done this and they've done that, you know, they've touched the whole house. They've cleaned continuously. But they might not be cleaning continuously. Mm. But their house shows that there has been care taken in every part to be touched. And it's the same way in prayer. Is whatever is around you can be prayed for. Jesus said this. He said, Every idle word will be judged. And what I believe he means by that is he says, Take your words seriously. What I believe he further means by that is if you see a situation where you can play, pray and bless, it's probably better to do that. You might actually see some outcome from it. If you simply say there's weeds there, it doesn't help the weeds. Weeds are going to grow. God's looking to cultivate a garden where he can come in and show his goodness. If you're praying for your family, keep praying for them. If more weeds get up, pull the weeds in prayer. Until you see a garden, then you see a harvest of righteousness if we don't give up. Luke 21, 36. Mm -hmm. It says, Watch therefore and pray always that you be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and stand before the Son of Man. Okay, so Jesus tells us the way to be ready. Watch, again there's that word, be aware, and pray that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. That's, that's loaded. We could do several teachings on that. What it means, in essence, is the continuity with which you live your life will one day be the screen between you and the Lord of how you live. Now, salvation is a free gift. Our sins are covered by the blood of Jesus. But the Bible talks about that there is a, a moment when we stand before God, which is called the Bama Seat of Christ, where he will judge our works. And here's the criteria for works. Wood, hay, and stubble. Gold, silver, precious stones. And he says, I don't understand all this, but it says it's going to go through his fire. It's going to go through his analysis, you could say. And those things which were done in coordination with the Holy Spirit and a pure heart, they could have been messy, but they were done. You gave the cup of cold water to the person, and you didn't want to, but in your heart of hearts, you're like, I'm doing this as unto the Lord. And you're, Jesus says, that won't be forgotten. Jesus said, small things, not forgotten. I've had people remind me of things that I did years ago, thankfully good things, <laughs> is that I've forgotten about. No idea. They said, you remember when you did X, Y, Z? And it really blessed me. We had dinner at your home the other night, and your mom said, do you remember how back years ago and you said this, this, and this? And I was like, man, I forgot about that. It's like, I need to get back to that. <laughs> <laughs> Life's happened. Life's happened. We need the Lord, just like Peter's feet. We need the Lord to come and touch our and wash our feet. We need Him to help us. I tell you why, because He says, You're not in need of your whole body being clean, but you're walking in the world, and I need to come and I need to freshen you up sometimes. We should pray that. If we start finding we're jaded towards people, or somebody did us wrong, and so now we're pulling back from everybody, we need a good foot washing. We need to come before the Lord with a spirit of humility and say, Oh God, wash my feet again. Humble. I, I want to come to you in a spirit of humility and pliability. I don't want my heart to be hard. Why? Because one day we're going to stand before Jesus. And it's going to matter. I don't want to stand before Jesus with a hard heart. 
He says, man, how you started? Great. You trusted me to make that hard. And then you kind of pulled back. You took your eyes off me. But you did a lot of good. But uh, there's some wood, hay, and stubble over here. But you started over here. I want to say, well, you have some wood, hay, and stubble to start. But your heart was right. And you continue to trust me. And there's some gold, gold silver, and precious stones for you. Now, what are those? What is that treasure? What is that reward? It's the character he's formed in you, it's the internal things, but it's also the people you've impacted. But you made a difference in their lives, and it's going to ripple for eternity. The Bible says you don't get your rewards to the end. You want to know why? Because it's an investment that lives after you die. The investments that Bill and Jean have made over their years in people's lives, and sometimes with ingratitude from people. But I hear people. We heard recently from a person who's in jail who said, I miss those years. There was a seed that's planted there. That, that person's going back to that time. Or I, I remember when I lived with Hal for a couple of weeks and, and there was peace there. I remember when Bill and Dean were good to us back then, and nobody's been really good to us. We've gone. As a matter of fact, we've not been good. That seeds. Some of those people are going to make it home. It's a mess, but they'll make it. And then the Lord will sort it out. And he'll say, See, we did this, we invested in this area. Uh, Marcus and I were riding through Cripple Creek yesterday on the way to work. And we drove by Big Daddy's old house, which is now abandoned. No trespassing. And we talk about that area, and I said, yeah, Marsha came, and she did this, and she invested in that house, and then there was this ministry, and we'd go knock on doors. And I said, the Marcus said, you know, don't pray over this area. And this area now is thriving. Maybe not the way we thought. But that area is going from being a curse in Greenville to actually they're putting condos up. They're doing all kinds of stuff in that area. You know the value? I said, if I had only known. They would have given you houses back then. <laughs> I mean, maybe three thousand dollars. They were dumps, and that those places are so expensive now. What twenty years can do? But that area was bathed in prayer for years. Uh, there was a difference. The atmosphere was softened. Now I agree, there are people doing this, that, and the other there, but God shifted things there. Stay sober, alert. Faithful from the inside. Okay, this, this is what I went to this first. Stay faithful with all wisdom in all matters until he comes. Luke 19.13 says this. He says, Occupy until I come. Okay, what should we do when all this is going on in Russia and Ukraine? And Jesus said, Well, what have I set before you today? Are you being faithful with it? Because the world, there's a wake-up call in the world that says, You can't go and do that or can't change that, you can pray for that. But are you doing what I've called you to do here? Here's why. Because the Bible doesn't say that nation against nation will cause the end to come. Hmm. It says the gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the nations as a witness to all people and then the end will come. Am I being a witness? Am I being a witness on my job? Am I being an encouragement to other believers? There is, if you look in uh, Thessalonians, 5, 11, you don't have to go there, but at the end of it, it talks about nuclear reality. But then at the end of it, it says encourage those around you as you see the day approaching. I tell you, one of the greatest ministries in the times to come is going to be to be an encourager. People are going to be blown. Oh, gosh, did you see this and that? Oh, and that happened. You know, we're reaching a point where it's like, in the past, we... We're like, man, we, we dodged the bullet on that. We're not dodging the bullet in the world very much anymore. Things are going to happen that before were just threats. Stay faithful with wisdom in all matters until he comes. The fourth is be encouraged with his perspective. Stay in joy. Don't be offended. There are verses there for that. In essence... Stay close to the Lord. Keep it local. Act lo local. Pray global. But act local. 
The biggest area in sphere of influence you can change is right around you. How can I make your life better as the Holy Spirit guides me? How can you make my life? If we do that, man, we are moving in the right direction. Amen. Stay close to the Lord, to his people. Act locally. Pray globally. And it is going to turn out best for you. I tell you, I don't know what's ahead the next few days, but we're going to reach into the Lord. We're going to pray, and we're going to see the glory of God come in our own hearts and lives. Because all of those promises say that God's going to be doing something to his people in these times. Amen. We're going to do prayer. I pray that this message today, if there's a take home, it's that you have a role in this time. You were born for such a time as this. Take yourself seriously. In the grace of God and in who He is. And so and we'll see good things. You can change your region through prayer, you can change your region. As you engage to seek and partner with the Lord for why he's placed you where you are.